Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're going to try and start on time so we can get everybody out on time. I know it's a big commitment on a Saturday morning to, to carve out and come to a workshop like this. My name is Steve Smedberg. I'm uh, the president of the volunteer group for St. Vincent de Paul here at Our Lady Queen of Peace. I'm also on the board of directors for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul uh, in Madison. Um, but we're here today to talk about my boss and all of us who volunteers boss. And our bosses are our neighbors in need. We're a servant leadership organization, which means we answer to the people we serve, whether we're high up in the organization or the volunteers who go out and visit people, some of whom are in this room or are gonna go visit some of our neighbors in need later this morning. Um, and so that's what we're here to talk about. We're also here uh, to talk about um, what we think about poverty. And um, I was thinking about what I should say, and I had this idea last night that, you know, sometimes when the lottery jackpot gets to $400 million, I buy a ticket. <laughs> but when it's $40 million, the odds are against it. It's a stupid idea. Why in the world, logically speaking, that left side of my brain says, don't buy a lottery ticket. But suddenly, $400 million, I'm in, doing something that doesn't make sense to most other people. And it's clearly not logical to most of us. And that's the same thing that happens for everybody in all sorts of different circumstances. And it's particularly true when we talk about poverty. And Josie's gonna share with us um, a way to think about how being in poverty really affects the lives of those we serve. Before we start St. Vincent de Paul meetings, we always start with a prayer. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is cracking. I have a little bit of a cold. And uh, so I'd like you to join. If you know the words, join in. Otherwise, uh, I'll just read this. I carry it around with me, as you can tell. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. <clears throat> Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I'd like to introduce Josie Montanez Toiler, Tyler, sorry, practice that 400 times. Let's try it again. <laughs> Josie Montanez Tyler, she's the Associate Service Center Director for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, and she's going to lead our workshop. Uh, for those who weren't pulled in by actually knowing who I am and uh, wanting to actually see me stand up somewhere for an hour and a half, I appreciate you coming as well, absolutely. Um, especially on this warm Saturday morning um, when you could be out playing some sort of sport or something like that. So, um, that was a joke, by the way, because it's horrible outside. Anyway, um, so today I'm going to talk about a few things, but I want to give a little, uh, a brief introduction to Dr. Donna Beagle. Um, has anyone heard of her before, hopefully? Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, she is an expert, as some would say, on poverty and the different types of poverty that are out there. Uh, she uh, actually ended up being our keynote speaker for the St. Vincent de Paul National Assembly in 2014. So we had the privilege of listening to her speak for about an hour, and she also did some workshops uh, later on that day and the day after that, So, and I made sure to sign up for all of them. So um, definitely got uh, some wonderful knowledge from her. And uh, we also had some summer book groups, some fall book groups at St. Vincent de Paul uh, to cover her book, See Poverty, Be the Difference. That one right there, feel free to pick it up. It is a great book. Um, she herself was actually from generational poverty, so she 
goes into generational poverty very deeply. Um, if she's an expert on anything, it's definitely uh, that point of view and, and coming from there and getting out of that type of poverty. Uh, but she also covers several other types of poverty. We won't be going into all of those today, though. Uh, I'll just be talking about four of them, but that'll be later on. <laughs> Um, so St. Vincent de Paul, in the last few years, they've been making some additional efforts, uh, trying to you know, have think tanks and stuff like that as far as how we can expand our efforts to help our neighbors in need. Uh, we definitely don't want to cut out any of the programs that we already have, you know, our food pantry, our charitable pharmacy, clothing vouchers, furniture vouchers, all of these things. Um, we don't want to stop anything, but we, we are looking to help those who are in a place to uh, start working to get out of poverty, kind of uh, help boost them and support them and maybe even get a sphere of mentors around them to help lift them up. So uh, with that in mind, it brings us to today. And this is one of St. Vincent de Paul's first efforts in the expansion of helping our neighbors in need. So I'm gonna start diving into some stuff here. Why are we all here today, besides to maybe hear a couple of bad jokes? Um, <laughs> the first reason would be to hopefully gain a deeper understanding of poverty and those who are living in the crisis of poverty. But the main reason for me would be to help everyone get a deeper awareness of how they feel about people in poverty. So the, their, your own attitudes, values and beliefs about those who are living in poverty. That can be something hard to do, but we're definitely going to try and break through some of those layers today, because if you are judging, then you cannot connect. And if you cannot connect, then you cannot communicate. And if you cannot communicate, you cannot break poverty barriers. You'll hear me say that a few times, so get used to it. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. So um, in order to do that, though, in order to break through some of that stuff, you actually have to talk about the elephant in the room above me here, far above my head. Wow, I'm short. So um, what you're seeing above me is a whole bunch of stereotypes and assumptions about those who are living in the crisis of poverty. Very unfortunate. And at some point in time, maybe a couple of these, I've even thought. Uh, it's just kind of something that we do as human beings. Way back in the day, it was part of survival to make assumptions about our environment. Uh, check everything out, you know, we're trying to pick some berries, stay alive, not get eaten. You know, so we, we survey the scene and uh, make sure there's nothing coming over to eat us. So we make some assumptions about our environment and the things that are in our environment. These days, uh, in the current times, we don't really need to check out and see what's going to eat us in a room. So we can kind of back away from a lot of those reflexive assumptions that we have. I call them reflexive assumptions because they really seem like something that happens before you can even like grasp a situation. So that's how they happen within me. They seem like a reflex. So what I've trained myself to do is to have a second reflex. And that's what I would encourage all of you guys to start working on, is if you do have an assumption about uh, those who are living in the crisis of poverty, to try and stop yourself and think about what else could be going on there. So what I'd like to do is, well, I won't hand it out yet, yet but in, there, in the folder that I'm going to hand out in a little bit, not quite yet, let's not rush it. Uh, I don't need you reading everything in there instead of listening to my bad jokes. Um, in there, there's going to be a packet, and in that packet, there's going to be a list of different facts about those who are living in the crisis of poverty in America. I would like for you to, you know, after the basketball game, I think is what the sport is. <laughs> um, I was told basketball, which is important to some people, and that's great. Go Badgers. Um, <laughs> uh, Want to get you out in time for the Badger game. Don't worry. I'm going to speak swiftly. But after the game today, when we win, I'm assuming, um, men's basketball? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Go men's Badgers. Okay, so uh, after that, and you're all hyped up from the win, um, if you want to sit down and go through that packet, look at some of the facts, some of the stats in there, try to see if, uh, when you're reading that, if your own beliefs about poverty 
match up with those statistics, match, match up with those facts. And if they don't, maybe start questioning them. Why do I not agree with this? That kind of thing. Because it's okay to not agree, but at least know why you don't agree, why you don't believe um, something that may be a fact. So what I'd like to do with one or two of the unfortunate uh, stereotypes and assumptions is get rid of them and uh, kind of work through one or two of them today, kind of show you if I was at home thinking something like this, uh, which is a great place to practice in a controlled environment before you get out into, if you're a home visitor, before you go out in someone's home, you know, um, then I, I am essentially going to show you how I would go about making a little mental list or even writing it out if you really want to get into it um, when you do come up with uh, such assumptions in your lovely minds. Cool? Cool. Awesome. I'm pumped. Okay. So, uh, as you saw, there's some assumptions. I am just going to pick a couple out out of there. Um, Pre-picked. Sorry. Um, so, the first one I'm going to go with is uh, that those who are living in the crisis of poverty, low-income parents, they don't really care about education or the education of their children. So if I were thinking about that, I would want to do some dialectical thinking. Um, and that is pretty much when you are uh, using the ability to view different issues, situations, and decisions from multiple perspectives. So um, that is something that Donna Beagle talks about. Get the book. Woo, OK. Um, all right. I'm at school, volunteering at my kids' school, tons of fun, gotta love kids. And I'm in the classroom and I realize that, you know, I never see so-and-so here. And so-and-so just so happens to be um, a parent who is in poverty. And I all of a sudden come up with the assumption that they must not care about their kids' education, supporting them through this. Um, what I would do is sit down and start thinking about, hmm, what are some other, other th possibilities there? Well, I would come up with, if I'm there during the day, if I'm in their school during the day, then maybe their parent, uh, maybe that parent has a full-time job that doesn't have a lot of flexibility. There are plenty of jobs, um, hourly wage jobs, that don't have the kind of flexibility where you can just leave for a couple hours and then go back. Let's say they did have the flexibility, you're allowed to leave for two hours and then make it up later, uh, there's a lot of people who can't actually afford their own vehicle. So if I work on the south side, like I do, ooh, St. Vincent Paul, um, and my kid's school is on the east side, like it is, uh, it may only take me 15, maybe 20 minutes to drive there. Piece of cake. But um, when my son actually takes the bus from his school to my job, Depending on the time of day, it can take, the minimum is 45 minutes. Sometimes it takes them an hour and a half to get there because you have to transfer buses. So if I, wanted, if I was a parent and I wanted to be at my kid's school for two hours, but it takes an hour to get there, an hour to get back to work, and just because I want to be there for these specific hours, that doesn't mean that right when I'm done with those two hours, that bus comes right then, right after, it just shows right up when I'm done with something. That's not how the bus schedule works, if you know about the uh, buses. So, it can literally take over a half a day of work just to get a little bit of time in at my kid's school, if I have that flexibility. And a lot of people don't, like I was saying. Something to think about. All right, so what if I'm at an after-school event? You know, it's the evening. They should be able to be there, right? Well, there are plenty of people who have... Uh, jobs that are in the evening, in the afternoon. So same problem with uh, the flexibility of a schedule. Uh, the whole hourly wage job I idea, uh, that really does affect things. You're talking about jobs where there might be quotas. There, there may be jobs, uh, they might be in a job where they have like blackout dates where no one can take off, that kind of thing. Um, you know, supply and demand. Uh, and also, just the whole lack of, when you have a salary job versus an a hourly job, um, there really does seem to be a difference in the benefits that you get. So paid time off, that kind of stuff, uh, making up your hours whenever you want-ish, you know, it doesn't really exist 
in the hourly wage sphere. So those are just a few things that I can think of uh, to counter the assumption of they just don't care. There can be so many different reasons why a parent isn't there. So there's my first example. Woo, all right, we got through a page, folks. Feel free to stretch, feel free to stretch. So when we aren't doing this, uh, when, when we're just going with these assumptions, uh, Dr. Donna Beagle, she calls this the faulty attribution theory. Um, I will be giving you some notes later, so you don't necessarily have to write all this stuff down, but who knows? You might. I don't know. You don't know what's in those notes. Um, I am not from the, the kind of place where, you know, you get a whole bunch of uh, agendas and whatnot, so um, definitely feel free to take notes. Kind of might be throwing you off right now. Uh, Dr. Donna Beagle talks about two different cultures. There's the... Um, Oh, careful. There is the oral culture. So you're just used to hearing stories, getting your facts verbally, using your hands. What is this up here? Okay. Um, and then there's the print culture where you're, you are used to having that agenda. You are used to having times there. You're used to getting your information uh, from some kind of print. So good luck getting that from me because... <laughs> I am from an oral culture. So um, in the notes, though, there will be a, defin uh, a little definition page. So faulty attribution theory. That is uh, when we give motives to someone else's actions or behavior without seeking the why beh behind the behavior. Uh, we do this all the time. All the time. Um, that's how we think. Everything's from our own personal point of view, and it takes extra effort to go outside of that and think about things from other people's point of view and their situation. So just try not to have that whole faulty attribution theory thing going on, okay? It really is a kind of a reflexive thing. But if you're doing that, in a way, you're kind of judging, you're assuming. And like I said before, get ready for the second time. If you are judging, then you cannot connect and if you cannot connect, you cannot communicate. And if you cannot communicate, you cannot break poverty barriers. All right, we might just have that memorized by the end of this. Pretty excited. Someone will have to say it back to me. Just kidding, okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give you a personal example because no one is perfect. I, like I said, I make plenty of assumptions, but I have tried my best to train myself to have a second reflex behind those assumptions. So um, my own personal example of this is when I started working over at the service center uh, about four and a half years ago. Oh my goodness, time flies. Um, <laughs> been with St. Been with Vincent de Paul for about six and a half years. So I uh, spent most of my time over at the service center. When I started working over there, I had a uh, minivan that I inherited from my stepdad. I was pretty proud of my minivan. I named it. Uh, it, her name was Big Bertha. She was beautiful, e rust and all. Um, so even though it was inherited, it was used, a little rusty. It was the best vehicle I had ever had. It even had the whole bloop bloop. I was like, what? It has a bloop bloop. Okay. So um, I, was, I was pretty proud of her. So Parker in the back of the building, walk around front, and um, every once in a while I would run into a vehicle that I'd be like, hey, someone fancy must be here. That's a... That's a fancy one. Um, and then I'd notice that maybe a client would get out of that vehicle and I would start having some negative thoughts uh, towards that situation, uh, like they don't necessarily have the right to have that kind of vehicle, like they should be making more sacrifices um, if they have to be in that line. Start going right to judging. and. Um, Luckily for me, my, my best friend uh, knows a lot about cars, so I've been forced to learn a lot about cars. And she let me know that um, there are definitely different reasons for people having snazzy-looking cars. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few things that um, I start thinking, I try to start thinking of when I start making a negative assumption about someone's vehicle out front. Um, the first one that my best friend taught me is just because it looks snazzy doesn't mean it is snazzy. There are plenty of vehicles out there that look all sparkly and sharp 
as my mom would say. Um, and they're really low quality on the inside. You know, it's all about the flash and it doesn't really have a lot on the inside. So that's one option. It could actually be a pretty cheap car, but look pretty snazzy. Another option is maybe they're in situational poverty, which is just another way to say uh, temporary poverty. Uh, four and a half years ago, that was a lot closer to when the recession started. Um, and just because there was an official start to the recession doesn't mean the recession started at the same time uh, for everyone. So someone could have easily had a job for 10 years, you know, uh, going every day, completely dedicated, feeling pretty secure in their job. And so then what's the problem with getting a new vehicle? You're making the payments. A lot of people, most people, that's how they buy their new vehicles is through payments. You get a loan. Um, so what's the problem if you have a steady job with getting a new vehicle? Well, you lose that job. You still have the vehicle. You've made some payments. You've invested in this vehicle. Uh, if I had to choose between giving up my new sparkly vehicle, and who's to say what's new? It could be like two years old and it still looks all shiny and sparkly. But um, if I had to choose between giving away my, or giving up my vehicle, or going to a food pantry or two every month until I got back on my feet in that situational poverty, I would choose going to a food pantry or two a month but until I get back on my feet. Because if you still have hope that things are gonna get better, then why break your life down more than it needs to be? Um, you can also use that vehicle to go to job interviews and it'll help you get a job, who knows? Um, so it's definitely some stuff that I, that I end up thinking about pretty fre frequently um, when I have that reflexive assumption in my head. Um, it's, it's just always good to uh, be practicing that. And like I said, I've been doing this for years, trying to counter those assumptions in my head. And every once in a while, like if I go to work and I'm in a bad mood, and it'll automatically come out and then I need to check myself. So it's definitely something that we have to always work on if it's something that we are looking to change within ourselves. An example outside of me, I put me first. You see that? You see that? So now I can talk about other folks. <laughs> um, example, an example outside of me would be um, every once in a while I hear um, from a home visitor that the, uh, they went on a home visit, and that's awesome. They are seriously an amazing group of people taking their time out and going into people's homes um, and just doing all the stuff that they do. But every once in a while, um, it, it can even be an observation, not even like a, a negative judgment, but they'll bring up that they notice a very big flat screen TV in the home. This, it's the most common uh, comment. So um, what I always like to do is, you know, point out just the first things I think of uh, when it comes to that, just to, uh, just in case they weren't thinking about it. Who knows? It, it could just be a statement. But um, some of the things that I point out, my little uh, verbal list to people when they come into my office and get me talking, <laughs> you should know better, um, <laughs> is first off, um, all right, I have a flat screen TV in my house. In fact, I have more than one. Um, and all I know is I really, really, really wouldn't want to give that up. And I doubt that all of us would want to give that up either if you have it. It's something you're used to having. It's entertainment. They're amazing. So if we want it, there's no reason why people who are uh, in poverty shouldn't want that as well. That's the first thing I point out. We all deserve it. Um, this isn't about what we do and do not deserve. That's the first thing. Um, after that, I make a bad joke to them to loosen them up. And then I bring up how, um, when you think about it, if I want to entertain my kid, I can take him out to a movie a, a few times a month even. Um, let's just say one time a month, just basics. Um, if I need to uh, get away for a little bit, I can get a babysitter. I can afford that. Um, some people can even afford something beyond a babysitter, like a nanny or something like that, or a manny, uh, something like that. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a more politically correct way to say that, but anyway, that's all I know, nanny and manny. Um, there are those options for getting 
away from the kids. Um, the, the other thing that I point out is if someone is a single parent, you're doing it all on your own. You're working your full-time job probably, and then you're coming home and you have your kids, they're doing their homework, sure, but they can't do homework all night, you know, and if you want any time to yourself, every once in a while it is really nice to just be able to turn something on the TV and to have a moment to yourself, to be able to reflect or calm down, center yourself, you know, I think it's best for everyone if a parent gets to do that every once in a bit. Um, and not even necessarily for themselves, like a time just to, you know, I don't know, take a really long bath. Not my thing, go for it, you know, but if that relaxes you. But um, let's say they need a moment to themselves so that they can make the whole family, the entire family dinner, as simple as that. It's a, it's a nice, safe solution to um, keeping those kids entertained for a little bit. Another thing that I point out uh, that isn't often thought about is these families usually aren't li living in the safest of neighborhoods. So if I was living in these neighborhoods and there was a shooting two months ago, like two blocks away or something like that, and if I had to choose between my kid playing out in the parking lot in that kind of neighborhood or being inside where I know they're safe and being entertained, I would much rather them watch a little extra TV than put them in danger. And um, that is something that actually, I've never had the opportunity to say anyone because I just thought about it the other day. <laughs> so um, these are things that, you know, they aren't at the forefront of our mind when, when we're going into someone's house. We just see that TV and we're like, mm, that's maybe not the best. Uh, use of your funds. Uh, so lastly, who doesn't like having a little le something extra, right? Um, every once in a while, you want to treat yourself. Some people, they go to a spa. Some people get a massage. Some people sit down, read a book, and some people, they sit down and watch their favorite soap opera or something else that we all don't really want to admit we watch, you know? Like, we all have a little something where you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to tell anybody about this one, but it's good, you know? We all have that. Well, maybe if you don't, then you're looking at me like, I'm cr they're out there, okay? My sister still watches soaps, and I didn't even know they were still on TV, so... Um, people are doing it. People are doing it. Some things to think about. Uh, it's the little things that keeps the hope at a healthy level inside of people. If you, if you never get to um, kind of shake it off and focus on something else, then you are always just focusing on life. And life isn't always that pleasant. So anything that can kind of give you a little bit of mental time off that, you know, isn't like necessarily a, a drug or anything even. It's just a little bit of entertainment. I say go for it, please, especially those parents. Like I said, I think it's good for everyone involved when they get a minute to themselves and when a parent can actually keep the hope up inside of them when they get a little bit of break. Um, hopelessness, according to me, this is not a fact, but to me, I think that that is the, the saddest and most dangerous part of being in poverty that breaking down of someone on the inside. Because really, what's the point if you don't have hope for your future? If you have kids, if you don't have hope for your kids' future? Like, why are we even going to work every day? Why are we gonna work the rest of our lives? Because most of them won't even be able to retire. retire. Why are we doing this? So um, with that in mind, actually, I'd like to read you a quote that I swiped and Kathleen Dare, yeah, swiped it, okay. She led one of our um, book groups this past fall, and she snatched me up one day and asked me to sit in to answer some questions, and I had the uh, privilege of being there when she read this quote, so I was like, can I have a copy of that swipe? So I swiped it, okay. Um, it's from a, a blogger, I believe. It was. A, it's an anonymous blogger, but it is someone who... Um, is living in the crisis of poverty. Uh, and I actually, I did a, a tr I like, okay, it says anonymous, but I'm gonna find who did it, you know? So I did my little detective work and everything, and yeah, it's anonymous. It's, <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Yeah, no matter how hard you look, anonymous means anonymous. So um, what I do know is this, it, it's a woman. Uh, she has kids. Uh, she does have a, a husband. Um, so she does have someone who is going through this with her, kind of partner uh, in life, uh, but can still get to you, you know? And then I just, I add on the whole maybe being a single parent. and blah. So I'm going to read this for you. I make a lot of poor financial decisions. None of them matter in the long term. I will never not be poor. So what does it matter if I don't pay a thing and a half this week instead of just one thing? It's not, it's not like the sacrifice will result in improved circumstances. The thing holding me back isn't that I blow five bucks at Wendy's. It's that now that I have proven that I am a poor person, that is all that I am or ever will be. It is not worth it to me to live a bleak life devoid of small pleasures so that one day I can make a single large purchase. I will never have large pleasures to hold on to. There's a certain pull to live life, what bits of life you can while you have money in your pocket. Because no matter how responsible you are, you will be broken three days anyway. When you never have enough money, it ceases to have meaning. I imagine having a lot of it is the same thing. Something to think about. A little bit of something to have hope. If my kids really wanted to go out to Wendy's, I don't know. Okay, you know, Culver's or something. Let's make it local. Um, some semi-local. Uh, if my kids really wanted to go out to Culver's, and I had twenty bucks, and I am supposed to send that to the rent-to-own place for our flat-screen TV that I'm paying on weekly, maybe twenty bucks a week. Man, it would make everybody really happy just to go out once this month. So maybe we'll all do that instead, because no matter what, I'm not going to be able to afford all the bills anyway. Something to think about. All right. Now, got through another page. We are kicking butt, folks. This is, <laughs> oh, man, I don't even know what to do with myself here. Okay. So I wanted to give one more, uh, I, I wanted to stop on one more topic, one more of those assumptions. I'm not going to go through nearly, I'm not going to go through that list, that process of maybe it's this or maybe it could be this or anything like that. I just wanted to uh, throw out a stat or two about one of those other assumptions, um, the whole laziness factor, poor work ethic, that kind of thing, because I've always had a very, very strong opinion on that stereotype. I don't care for it, not one bit. So, <laughs> um, so this one's really just for me. But um, okay, <laughs> so uh, that whole laziness thing, lack of work ethic. Uh, an interesting fact that is in your packet, so you don't necessarily have to write it down, but you can if you want. If you're that kind of per if you learn that way. Um, so, two thirds of people who are living in the crisis of poverty have 1.7 jobs. I said, two-thirds of people who are living in the crisis of poverty have 1.7 jobs. Let's simplify that and say a job and a half, okay? Um, I like telling that to is anyone who will listen. That's a current fact, um, and it's really, really important to keep in mind. There are so many people out there working their butt off and still not able to make ends meet. That whole hopelessness factor, that's where that really comes in. You're working your butt off, and you never, never mind getting ahead. We're talking about just being able to keep up, you know, the basics. Being able to, when your kid needs some new shoes, working your butt off and still not being able to afford that. Really, the basics. So, with that, now I will hand out the folders. Okay. <laughs> so, this is what I like to call an exercise. It's really just something to think about. It's going to, be, it's going to end up being more of a, a visual thing, more of a maybe you'll end up feeling it, that kind of thing. Everybody have a, you got enough folders? Everybody good? Everyone have one? Wonderful. All right. Sorry if the timeline, the, the print is a little small. Um, you know, what are you going to do? I'm not that great with computers. So, all right, here's what we're going to do. This exercise is called... How does this impact your day? My first question before we even begin is, how many of you have ever heard that those who are living in the crisis of poverty in America are lazy? 
Raise a hand. Feel free to just raise it. Yep. Okay. That's almost everyone. Yeah. Um, and if you didn't raise your hand, someone probably said it and you just didn't remember, you know, or I put you on the spot, something like that. It's everywhere. It's very prominent. Um, so just keep that in mind. We've all heard it. Now, directions. Listen carefully. I love the silence. I feel like I'm a teacher. Okay. Um, on your paper, write down a schedule of a typical or stereotypical day of a family of four. That's two parents who both work and two kids who are both in school. Maybe like one's in middle school, one's in elementary school or something. Go for it. Go for it. Don't look at me. Man. <laughs> paper. Yes. Um, and, you know, it can be pretty simple, you know, wake up, breakfast, drop kids off, you know, that kind of thing. Go to work. Yeah, come home. Don't forget to go to sleep at night. That's important. <laughs> okay. Before we begin, one more thing. Uh, so, we are going to need to update our schedules. Ha, we did this in pen. Yes. Um, so... <laughs> We're going to have to update our schedules because approximately 60% of U.S. children living in a single-family household, they are impoverished compared to only 11% of two-parent families. Your spouse is no longer in the picture, which means you lost his or her half the income, by the way. Just a little aside, push up the pressure. Um, so you are now the main character in this story. Look alive, folks. Look alive. Um, if you need to change anything on your timeline... Now would be the time. You can do that while I'm reading the rest of the instructions. Brilliant. Good work. Nice updating. You guys are doing great work. Awesome. Okay. Legible. Has to be legible. I don't care. Okay. At the end of each paragraph, I will say the phrase, how does this impact your day? At that time, you'll have about 20 seconds or so Hurry up. to change what needs to be changed in order for the timeline to match the story. If you notice something while I'm saying a paragraph, you can feel free to start changing it then. Um, I'm not the best with numbers, so I personally would start making changes right away. But um, there will be a little bit of time in between each paragraph for you to do that if you need. Okay, let's begin. Please look at your schedule. Now, imagine that you work a minimum wage job. The average hourly rate in America for this type of job is $7.25. That's about 15000 a year before taxes. So every hour that you are scheduled to work is crucial, and your family can't afford for you to fall short in this area. Now, imagine that your youngest child is up all night with a fever, but you don't have any Tylenol. You need to make that fever go away because in the morning that kid needs to go to school because you need to go to work. These are all needs. So you try to reduce the fever by putting the kid in a tub of cool water. You end up staying awake all night. You intended to get 30 minutes of sleep, but ended up sleeping through your alarm and didn't wake up until 7.15 a.m. Now you have 15 minutes to do what normally takes about an hour, but you still somehow manage to get your children on the bus at 7.30 a.m. How does this impact your day? Please make your changes. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Continue to make more if you need. Um, so, work starts at 9 a.m. And because reliable transportation is a luxury for people living in poverty, and according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average annual cost of owning and operating a used car or truck in America is approximately $6,000, you need to take public transportation. Woo, buses. It now takes you one hour to get to your job, five miles away. How does this impact your day? After work, you get on the bus at 5.30. You go across town to the food pantry, since you depend on it to get through the rest of the month until your food stamps are replenished. Food share. That kind of thing. You arrive at 6.15 p.m. The average wait time is anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half. Today you wait 45 minutes. 
and then you rush through the pantry, taking only 15 minutes, kick butt, in and out in an hour. You are now on your way home at 7.15 on the bus. How does this impact your day? You make it home an hour later and walk into your kids watching TV. What? You make a point to leave them there so you can make a quick dinner for everyone. You have just enough time to sit down with your kids and ask how their days went before leaving at 9.45 p.m. for your four-day-a-week job at the corner bar and grill where you work until 2 a.m. How does this impact your day? I think you just ran out of day. After you're done making your changes, check out that schedule. It's ridiculous. Let's even take out the whole that you were up all night, you know, because that doesn't happen all the time. But let's say this is, you know, four days a week. And even if you, um, let's say they were going to our food pantry, St. Vincent de Paul, we have one late night, but there are other pantries that, are, that have a different late night. So this may have been a Thursday night for this parent, but um, there could have easily been three other nights just like this, going to other food pantries, doing other things, that kind of thing. Um, if you were this parent, how would you feel if you had just like a one word response? The E word. Okay. Anybody else? Depressed. Mm. The D word. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some of you guys, you might not be wanting to say it, but you might be an optimist. You might be like, man, I'd be feeling pretty good because I just took care of all of my responsibilities. I kicked some butt, really to be honest, you know. Um, for anyone who thought I was lazy, please, I just worked my butt off. Um, if you are having that positive thought in your head, that is awesome. You have a great point of view on life. I'm going to bring you down a little bit. So, um, <laughs> just going to knock it down a peg. Um, that is probably the way that you might feel for a little bit. But after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, you get into a year. After a bit of time with this, that whole feeling amazing, like you accomplished something, would slowly start to fade. Because really, when you, at the end of the day, yes, you're, accomp you're accomplishing the whole survival factor. But in America, we thrive for much more than just surviving day by day. You know, we're not out in the wild. So we look to thrive. Um, and if someone isn't thriving, they're not even necessarily accomplishing much, if anything, in America. So um, there are plenty of messages out there that would go up against that uh, whole uh, positive attitude, and sooner or later it would probably go away, and you'd get to the whole exhausted, maybe even resentful, because you are working your butt off and not getting anywhere kind of point of view. Um, but I pointed out because there are approximately 4.1 million families in America right now that are doing, or that are having days just like that. Something to think about. Um, lastly, before I let you guys have a potty break or coffee break, stretch it out, whatever you do, um, about that whole two thirds of those who are living in the crisis of poverty having 1.7 jobs. How do we get out of that? How do we help people? How, do they, how can you even change that? Well, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says that there are two main variables to getting out of poverty. First one being gaining an education. The second one being gaining a skill. If I am working 1.7 jobs, let's say I have a kid at home, I'm a single parent, taking a bus to get from here to there, when do I have time to go back to school? or to become an apprentice. Something to think about. So, with that in mind, one more time for you. If you are judging, then you cannot connect. And if you cannot connect, then you cannot communicate. And if you cannot communicate, you cannot break poverty barriers. Feel free to go on your break. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
feeling good. Okay, okay. Folks have some snacks, all that whatnot. This half, it's a lot shorter. Um, I'm going to be going over a few facts and whatnot, um, but a lot of this is in your folder, so you don't necessarily have to feel like you have your uh, scribblings or wonderful, beautiful penmanship uh, has to keep up with how fast I'm going to be speaking here. So um, we have hopefully worked through a few of the um, different ways to break down some assumptions and whatnot. That's the second time I said whatnot, this half. It's going to be great. Um, so I figure at this point, we may as well get down to the whole, hey, what's poverty? What, what are we talking about here? What's that? Um, so the, uh, if, if you were to open up a dictionary, I guess it kind of depends on which one you do, but if you were to open up a dictionary, in general, it'd give you a definition something like this. Poverty, the state of being extremely poor. Well, if you know me, you know that's not going to work. So um, let's break it down a little bit more than that, um, because in America alone, like we're just talking about America here, um, I feel like it, it's an insult to leave it that, that general with how, what people are going through. So uh, first thing I want to uh, point out is that when we're talking about poverty in America, we're talking about more of a, a relative Poverty. We're not necessarily talking about destitution or an absolute poverty like in other countries. Although someone, there might be some, some pockets in there where people are literally fighting for every single drink of clean water, you know? But that's not necessarily the kind of poverty we're talking about in America. We're talking about, um, you know, the level of funds that it takes to actually live a basic life in America, have all of your needs met and your family's needs met. Um, it might cost a little bit more in America to uh, have the basics, or it might cost a little less than compared to somewhere else, but um, that's what we're talking about. We're not, even nece we're not necessarily talking about people being out on the street living in an alley. We're talking about the whole not being able to make ends meet. So there are people who are living in poverty who have an apartment, you know, who have a job, uh, so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about uh, when, well, when I'm talking about poverty anyway. Uh, because like I said before, uh, America, we're not just about day-to-day uh, -day survival. The American dream is to thrive. So that's what we're talking about. Everything that we work for, everything that we work towards. So I'm going to quickly go over four types of poverty. They are in your little, uh, your little uh, packet there. But... Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is generational poverty. The next one I'm going to talk about is immigrant poverty. The one after that will be situational poverty. And last but not least will be working class poverty. So generational poverty, what we're talking about there is pretty much uh, the insufficient funds to meet basic needs. They, these are the kind of people, Donna Beagle, if you read her book, this is what she talks about. Uh, her family worked during the day at odd jobs to pay for a meal at night. Like that's how unstable it, it, it is in that kind of situation. These, uh, these families or individuals have been in poverty for generations. It's what their family knows. It's their whole entire life. There isn't really another option out there for them. They haven't learned the value of education because it is never paid off for them, it's only worked against them, that kind of thing. So when I say unstable jobs, I'm talking about kind of like seasonal work or migrant work or uh, day labor, that kind of thing. Uh, as far as how they personally see poverty, we're talking about uh, majority of them are seeing poverty as a personal deficiency, something that's not quite right with them, like they did something wrong there. Um, and since I brought that up, an interesting little fact is America is one of the few countries that actually perceives poverty as the individual's fault instead of the conditions in which someone uh, w was placed. So when I'm talking about that whole absolute poverty thing, 
people who are living in absolute poverty in those countries, they, are, they aren't being blamed for not having any clothes or clean water, you know? Um, but in America, we absolutely put that on the individual and them being lazy or not working hard enough. So that's, that's something to think about. Since I started talking about other countries, let's go to immigrant poverty. Um, this one's pretty obvious. These are people who are coming to the U.S. They are immigrants here. Um, one of the, or two of the barriers that, additional barriers besides um, the normal barriers for people who are living in, in poverty would be the, the uh, barrier of learning the langu language, and the other one would be the barrier of like cultural uh, barriers, like if you are going into a job interview, uh, a lot of people would say that making eye contact when you speak to the person and shaking hands, those are two things you do for sure. In a different culture, both of those things might be super rude. So these are just little extra things that um, some people are dealing with uh, in the crisis of poverty once they come to America. So besides that, they act, uh, people who are living in immigrant poverty seem to end up doing a little bit better than Americans who are living in poverty here. Uh, and a lot of people believe that it's because they aren't putting that poverty on themselves. They are seeing it as an, a condition that they left behind. Uh, and they have yet to get all of the negative messages from our culture about it being a personal deficiency. So um, if they come from a place that was destitute and they leave that behind, they're like, I left behind poverty. It's not coming with me where I'm going. I'm going to make a new life. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not necessarily like they, they have some magical thing going on and that's why they do better here, anything like that. Uh, so then there is situational poverty. I did warn that I'd be going through these rather quickly. Some of you guys have a men's basketball game to get to. I remembered. <laughs> I said football game last night. I got looked at weird. Anyway, um, so I'm up on it. I'm feeling pretty hip and happening. Anyway, um, I just want to say hip and happening. So situational poverty. This one, very significant. They're all significant, but they are the ones that have potentially the most power in our culture. I'll get to why in a minute. Ah, suspense. Love it. Feel it grow. Okay, so uh, situational poverty, we're, deal re we're usually talking about the uh, type of person or family unit that uh, is coming from middle class, usually has a college background, an educated background, and then they hit some kind of crisis. Um, whether it be a loss of job, a divorce, a death, that kind of thing, where they lose a significant amount of income. But situational, another way to say that, temporary. It's just assumed from the very name that it's not going to last too long. So um, just from that, you can kind of uh, assume that it's not seen as a personal deficiency. But every once in a while, there is an exception. People, not everyone makes it out of situational poverty. Less and less these days. So it can absolutely end up feeling like a personal deficiency. But usually it ends up feeling like, yeah, something just went wrong, and I'm going to hop back up pretty soon here. Um, so these people who are in situational poverty, they're coming from a place uh, where they already have the clothes for these job interviews. They already have the social connections, the professional connections that are needed usually to help someone get back out of poverty. Um, they don't need uh, mentors from St. Vincent de Paul to surround them in a sphere of support, you know? They, are, they already have that. It's, it's been made just from them living their lives. They don't need to learn extra things, like the difference between uh, formal register and informal register, the proper way to say a sentence and all of this stuff. They know the, the fancy words already. They know the things that should be said in a professional interview. They have all of this. Now, if I was working in a factory and my cousin lost their job and I was like, hey, you know me, you have a connection. Maybe I can talk to somebody over here at my factory job and get you a position. That's not how it works when you're working um, low income, you know, hourly wage jobs. You don't, th those connections, they don't have power behind them. But as many of you know, in the professional world, 
those really those connections really do have significance. So those are things that um, someone who is in situational poverty may not be seeing. So then they get out of poverty. And they, if they didn't see all of those little things buzzing around them that came together, just made a link and lifted them up, then they might very well go, leave that uh, situational poverty with the assumption that, hey, they did it. Why can't everyone else do it? Maybe if you just make a few more sacrifices, the right sacrifices, you could do it. Maybe if you just worked a little harder, made some hard decisions. It's not easy, but you can do it. That's where they have the most power. They can do a lot of damage because people are more, most likely, out of all these different types of poverty, they're most likely to li listen to situational poverty people because um, it, they're usually the people who, you know, are, are dressing most similar to them, uh, sound like them, all of these things have that language to pull from. Uh, so these are all things to think about. They can use that power, that voice, to broadcast negative assumptions, but they also have the, most, uh, the biggest opportunity, the most potential to actually be advocates for those who are living in the crisis of poverty. If they are able to see all of those little links that came together and help them rise back up. So, situational poverty. <sighs> That's my short version, believe it or not. Um, last but not least, working class poverty. Woo, yes. Remember that whole two-thirds of people who are living in the crisis of poverty have 1.7 jobs? That's really where this comes into here, uh, into play. Uh, these people are working, more than likely working um, full-time, maybe even more, and they are still living paycheck to paycheck, if that, uh, which is really sad. I feel like, um, and I think this is more of a personal thing for me, I think it's like when, when Do Donna Beagle, when she gets going, she will spend a quite a bit of extra time on generational poverty because she was born and raised in it. She's really connected to it. Well, that's what you're gonna get from me with working class poverty. Um, it's what I was born and raised in, so I feel very connected to it, very passionate. That's why I have that whole thing about, you know, that whole work ethic uh, assumption. That's why I had to get my extra facts on it and everything, so uh, working class poverty to me is just it's really, really sad because we're talking about the, the section of poverty that actually bought into the American dream. That if you work hard enough, you will succeed. So these people are working a full-time job or a job and a half, and they're still not making ends meet. What else are you supposed to assume if you're working your butt off other than maybe you're just not smart enough. Maybe there's something else that's wrong with you. It, it ends up being uh, felt, it, taken in as a personal deficiency, which is really, mm, makes me very frustrated. Um, because, I mean, you can't work harder than, I mean, okay, okay, you know what, sleep less, and then you can actually have two full-time jobs, maybe, that kind of thing. But, like, you can't, you can't work much more. So, um, that one uh, can definitely, like I said, end up with a lot of internal and external assumptions uh, that are not positive, unfortunately. So with that said, I am quickly, since I brought it up, going to tell you just a little bit about myself. But in order to do that, I got to tell you a little bit about my mom. Okay, so my mom was born in Gary, Indiana. Anybody? Yeah, you know. Yep. Yeah. That's why she left when she was 17. She joined the army. Um, when she was 20, she got married and had my brother and my sister. My sister is 12 and a half years older than me and my brother is 10 years older than me. Uh, they grew up, they were born and raised in Alabama back in the day. So it was definitely a struggle. My mom unfortunately married a very, very, very abusive man who had a gambling addiction. So after he literally gambled the house away and the car, he ended up taking that anger out of my mom and she ended up in, intensive, in the intensive care unit. And then after she got out of there, she, uh, it was one of those just kind of lifetime movies where in the middle of the night you pack the bags and you leave kind of thing. So that's what she ended up doing with my brother and my sister and she went back to Gary, Indiana, which was the last place she wanted to be, and stayed with my grandma, who was awesome. Um, she was the right height too, right about yay. 
Yeah, a good, solid, respectable height. Anyway, um, so uh, my mom lived with my grandma for a couple of years, got a divorce from that fella, and then uh, went on assignment to Germany. What? Uh, with my brother and my sister while she was in the army. She was there for a few years. While she was there, she met my dad. He is a... May as well give you a little ethnicity back, background. My mom, she is African American. My dad, whom she met over there, is Puerto Rican. So when they met in Germany, what? Okay, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> they were both in the army, and they ended up being neighbors. And so, hey, let's grill out together. I don't know. They they ended up being neighbors for many a year. Um, when uh, right before they were coming back from Germany, my mom found out that my dad was actually married with two kids back in Puerto Rico. So, my mom came back, I know, that face is right. <laughs> what? What? Anyway, we'll get back to that later. Um, so my mom, she went back to Gary, Indiana, kind of, you know, a pit stop, didn't really know what was happening. My, my brother and sister were there. Um, oop, found out she was pregnant. Hey, there's Josie. Hey, Josie, what's up? Not yet. Not yet, we didn't know. But uh, when my mom found out that she was pregnant, that was kind of like the last push for her to get out of Gary. She moved to Madison. Why did she move to Madison? Well, she had never been here before, but she had heard good things. It reminds me of way back in the day with the big old ships when people were in other countries and your, your, your great grandparents or your grandparents or, you know, I don't know your ages, okay? I don't know your history. But uh, when essentially this happened to all of us, um, came over on a big old ship because they heard great things and they heard that this country was full of hope. That's what my mom did with Madison. She went across a few state lines because she heard that Madison was full of hope. So that's how I got here and that's how my mom got here, my sister, my brother got here. But by the time they got here, I mean, my brother and my sister, they were already like 10 and eight and you know, do the math, you know? All right, so in Madison, land of the dreams, you know? No, no, just like when people came over from other countries. No, no. So the grass is always greener on the other side. So my mom, even though she was in the army, she did her time. I made it sound like prison there. You know what I mean. Um, she spent a, a respectable amount of time in the army, uh, but she had only graduated high school, so she didn't really have like a higher education or anything like that. And unfortunately, her being in the army, didn't get her too far as far as the, a well-paying job, so she did end up working uh, two jobs my entire life. Uh, she never owned a vehicle, uh, and she never owned any type of property. So uh, it was pretty, we, we struggled quite a bit. It was definitely a paycheck to paycheck, probably actually a little bit less than that, which is why she had a job and a half. So she was a busy woman. Which makes me even more impressed by the fact that she signed us up for Head Start. Anybody? Head Start? Give me a nod. Yes. Okay. So Head Start, it's really for uh, really young kids, you know, cute and short, cute and short. Uh, you know, they, they get nutritional information. Their parents get nutritional information, extra education, all this kind of stuff. Um, they're really, their core thing is about uh, parent involvement. So my mom still had time for to go to Head Start with me once a week after school. It was pretty cool. Um, and then after that, she signed me up for Bootstrap. I am not going to explain every single one of these, uh, these after school programs because most of them don't exist anymore, which is really sad. You know who could do something about that? Everybody. Anyway, that's another. Don't get me started on monologues. Okay, so um, Bootstrap, after school program, hot meal, and we get to study. Homework, students from the UW, they would come in and they would tutor us. That was uh, late elementary through middle school, or sorry, to middle school. And then in middle school, I was in uh, the, one of the Urban League's first uh, after school programs back when they were a little tiny white house. Ah, they were adorable. So um, they had like four employees, please. Now they're like, okay, so that's another monologue. So um, I went to this after school program in middle school getting homework help every single day, Monday through Friday. A lot of structure. I was in all of these because my mom signed me up. Why? Because she needed to work. 
Um, so if that's a great alternative. Hey, you need to suggest something to someone, have them after school programs. That, that's what will get them there. So when I was in eighth grade, that's right, I'm making, this is a long story. I'm, I'm bringing it down for you. When I was in eighth grade, I heard about Upward Bound. Anybody? Yes? Yeah, in the back. Yes, right there in the middle. I saw somebody over here. Wonderful. No longer a program in Madison. Okay, so that one is the significant one. Um, they came and did a presentation uh, when I was in eighth grade, and so I filled out the 14-page application. Blech. Um, <laughs> but I was really excited to do that. If I didn't have all those, those um, after-school programs before that, I would have uh, been presented with that program and been like, that is totally above me, beyond me. Uh, but uh, since I was used to that kind of structure, I was like, oh man, I have been practicing for this my whole life. So uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the students who got admitted into that program, and then that is definitely one of the, the pinnacle points in my life, one of the points where the rest of it just would not have come together if I wouldn't have made that decision to be in that program. It was the kind of program where uh, the summer after eighth grade, there starts summer school, eight weeks. Uh, and I was in all of the classes, they, there were classes at the UW, all of the classes that I was gonna take as a ninth grader, I would take in the summer, it was a prep thing. So um, any of the students that were admitted into this program, they were supposed, like if, if we made it through the program, we would be the first uh, pre people in our family to actually go to college. So we were all revved up and ready to be the first. Um, so yeah, summer school, every summer for the classes that we were gonna take the next year. And then during the school year from uh, Monday through Friday from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., we had that whole hot meal and tutors. If you didn't have homework, then you worked on you, whatever it was that you weren't getting an A in. If you were getting an A in everything, and yeah, right, let me see it, then, <laughs> then study some more. Like you went no matter what, Monday through Friday uh, during the school year. During, oh, and we also, every other Saturday, we had maintenance classes as well for the classes that we were taking during the school year. So if you thought that you were going to get a little break during spring break, you thought wrong. Because during spring break, we were with Upward Bound as well, and they took us around to the different UW schools, and we would stay there for a week, approximately. And like stay at, like I remember staying in the lacrosse dorms and playing soccer with the freshmen, kicking their butt, by the way. Um, <laughs> Just a little aside, uh, you know, really getting a feel for being on campus, which was something completely new to all of us. And they made sure we had fun and liked it. You know what they did, you know, sprinkled the hope. You know what I'm talking about, put the sprinkle on. Um, so that pretty much whew, is upward bound. If you were to put all that down on paper, you'd be like, yeah, that's a solid way to college. Yeah, right? Okay, good. I'm coming back to that later. Now, I work for St. Vincent de Paul. Here's why. <laughs> uh, it's not just a job to me, not in any way whatsoever. Uh, when I was in elementary school through middle school, as soon as school was done on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was out of there with my backpack, my little Barbie pink backpack. I was gone, running down the street to St. Vincent de Paul on Willie Street, aka Williamson Street, for some of you who aren't from that side of town. Um, that used to be our only location, not seven stores, you know, and a processing center and a service center. That was our service center, it was our processing center, it was our food pantry. Alice, a lady named Alice, anyone? Anyone? Yes? Yeah! Woo! Alice! Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so Alice, she, uh, it, she would let you in the back door. She'd let kids in the back door on Tuesdays and Thursdays because she had a barrel that was full of candy. And I remember it like this big, but now that I think about it and I grew a couple of inches, it was probably like that big and like this. But um, I definitely had to bend over into there. It was a good solid workout. So. She lets you get three pieces of candy. And if you threw your, piece of, your, your wrappers away after you finished eating the candy, she would let you hang out there for a little bit. And that place was so cool that even my brother, who was 10 years older than me, would stop by there and get some candy and hang out. So yeah, I thought I was pretty dang cool chilling with those folks in the back room. Like seriously, could not have been cooler. It's probably the coolest part of my life. 
you know, not on the, from the outside, but in here. Um, so, careful. When I was going through the front door of the food pantry, either to get food or to get a clothing voucher or one of the other services with my mom, be standing in line, I'd get something along the lines of, hey kid, from Alice, and I would feel once again like I was standing in the back just as cool as ever, hanging out with the teenagers, <laughs> with my Barbie backpack. So um, that feeling, that extra familiarity that she took the time to uh, make us feel uh, really stuck with me. And then when it came time to whether or not I was going to try out for the soccer team in high school, I thought of going to St. Vincent de Paul and getting an extra clothing voucher. I was like, I'll talk to Alice and then maybe she'll give me an extra clothing voucher so that I can afford the soccer cleats. And holy crap, they had soccer cleats. And at the time, my favorite color was green and they had the green soccer cleats. It was amazing. Okay, it all came together. So it's all these little things that happened with St. Vincent de Paul that I never forgot, that whole feeling that somehow they still had me walking out of there feeling all chipper and proud and like everybody knows your name you know like that you know what i'm saying if you don't know that show you thought i was a little weird there that's okay that's okay I'm all right that so um it's definitely something that i held on to so when i was fortunate enough to go off to college come back with a couple of bachelor's bah, bachelor's degrees i saw that st Vincent paul was hiring and that's how i got here, whoo! <laughs> all right, all right. Now, I'm gonna bring it back around. <laughs> um, if you were to look at my story, those after-school programs on paper, it looked like a pretty steady trail. But for me, what I remember, that's not what I remember at all. What I remember is my mom saying, yeah, you really should apply to be an upward bound. They're gonna accept you first, I bet. Like, she was the kind of mom who, like, re like I, according to her, I literally could have been like a superhero or something like that. She thought that I could be anything and everything. And so now that I'm an adult, and I think about her working a job and a half, and how she struggled, and every once in a while she wouldn't pay a bill so that I could get new shoes or something like that. Um, and I think about how when we talk about that story, the exercise that we did, how you end up feeling at the end of that day, like that was my mom all the time. I wrote that exercise. It's my mom, literally. That's my mom. Um, she was never sad. She at least, I'm sure she was. But according to me, anytime I needed her, she was full of hope and inspiration. Like she was amazing. She was a superhero. Now, it really sucks that there are places in this world where our superheroes are working a job and a half. So, there were times when we were in line at the food pantry and someone would uh, actually pass by on the sidewalk and say something about those lazy bums. And I've always been short for my age. So, you know, I'm down here, probably should have been here. I'm down here, like ready to, like, kick a shin or something like that because I knew how hard my mom was working. It's something to keep in mind because if you're judging, then you cannot connect. And if you cannot connect, you cannot communicate. And if you cannot communica communicate, you cannot break poverty barriers. So that's my own story. Man, that was rough. That was a lot. Um, lastly, what can we do? How can we make some changes? These are nice and quick for you. Pretty simple, actually. Um, just takes a little time, a little effort. Uh, and actually, a little bit of this is in your packet. But uh, know as much as you can about the history of poverty and the structural causes of poverty. That's how you make a difference. Knowledge is power. You've seen the commercials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also try your best to understand the complexities of the many different uh, life experiences that we call poverty in America. So not all poverties are the same. Some people are working their butt off. Some people aren't able to even get a job, you know? So if we approach all poverty as the same, it's not the same solution. So we're not gonna fix anything. They're all very unique. So they need to be approached in different unique ways. So, number three, if you absolutely must assume something, assume that that person in poverty is making the best possible decisions in their situation. Those decisions are all hard ones. Uh, four, if you have the power, 
try to foster the kind of climate or environment where everyone is valued, everyone has a skill, everyone belongs, no matter where they're coming from. Because, you know, my knowledge is totally different than Steve's. But, oh, psh, this guy, say, charm, watch him. Um, but they're both very valuable. Uh, and then number four, anybody guess it? I'm going to say it. I'm going to do it. If you are judging, you cannot connect. That's right. If you cannot connect, then you cannot communicate. And if you cannot communicate, you cannot break poverty barriers. And I will leave you with one more thing. Hopefully, I got all of you here under the assumption that we would be challenging your assumptions. But I ask that you all leave here challenging not just your assumptions, but your judgments. Enjoy the basketball game. Basketball, Badgers. I win. <laughs>